Okay, are we live? We're ready. You ready, Dr. Glasgow? Yes, so they're coming. There's seven, eight, 10. 10, 11. So you tell me when to, when to begin. We're gonna start right now. Good evening, Augustonians. Welcome to 2021 and welcome back to Lake Friday. The August Wilson African American Cultural Center is excited to keep providing enriching and exciting programming for you. Be sure to mark your calendars as well. For the month of February, we are collaborating with Joseph Lewis, who's the founder of the Black Bottom Film Festival on a conversation with Blair Underwood and Melissa Hayslip about the documentary, Mr. Soul, that focuses on Hayslip's uncle, Ellis Hayslip, the creator and producer of the television program, Soul. Also on February 26th, we are welcoming world-renowned photographer Ming Smith for a conversation around her work and life. And please be sure to run to the post office to get your August Wilson stamps that unveiled yesterday. I am extremely happy to say welcome to Dr. Glasgow to our conversation. Tonight, we're gonna focus on the history of the Hill District, August Wilson's artistic adaptation of the Hill District into his century cycle and his life there. The book we're focusing on, August Wilson, Pittsburgh Places and His Life and Plays, struck several chords with me. When I moved to the Hill District, it was to begin my MFA in poetry at the University of Pittsburgh. I lived at 521 Francis Street in the Middle Hill for three years, wrote my own debut poetry book, Amphibian There, and won the prize that published it a week before gentrification in the Hill gave me cause to move out. While there, I became invested in the community and the history. I was healed, changed, loved, and shaped by the community there. And Rose's monologue from Fences was one of the first I ever performed in high school. And after moving to Francis Street, before I unpacked everything, I walked straight to where he was raised on Bedford Avenue, August Wilson. And I'm surely a benefactor of the legacy of the Hill District and the legacy of August Wilson. Now I'm gonna introduce Dr. Glasgow. Lawrence Glasgow is an associate professor of history at the University of Pittsburgh. He was born in 1940 in Zinnia, Ohio, located near Wilberforce University. In 1962, he received a BA degree from Antioch College and in 1973, a PhD in history from the State University of New York at Buffalo. His master's thesis described the racial philosophy of the Mexican philosopher Jose Vasconcelos and his dissertation examined the ethnic social structure of Buffalo in the mid 19th century. Since coming to the University of Pittsburgh History Department in 1969, he has focused on African American history, both locally and globally. Professor Glasgow has studied the history of Black Pittsburgh for the past decade or so. He researched and narrated the recent exhibition on slavery in, Pitt in early Pittsburgh, Free at Last, which is available online at www.library.pitt.edu forward slash free at last. His principal publications on the history of Black Pittsburgh include August Wilson, Pittsburgh, Pla August Wilson, Pittsburgh Places and His Life and Plays, which we'll talk about today, Teeny Harris, A Biography and Teeny Harris Photographer, Image, Memory, History, the WPA History of the Negro in Pittsburgh, Free at Last, opening essay in the catalog for the exhibition on slavery in Pittsburgh at the Heinz History Center, Three Rivers Youth, opening essay for the catalog of the exhibition at Heinz History Center, Someplace Special, The Struggle for Civil Rights in Pittsburgh for the Freedom Corner 2001 Memory Booklet, and then Optimism, Dilemmas and Progress, the Pittsburgh Survey in Black the Pittsburgh Survey in Black Americas in the M. Greenwald and M. Anderson edition of Pittsburgh Surveyed Social Science and Social Reform in the early 20th century. Glasgow completed the research for a documentary film, Barrier Breakers, Jesse Owens and the 1936 Berlin Olympics, which was shown at the 2016 Olympics in Brazil on the occasion of the 80th anniversary of the Berlin Olympics. Glasgow is now finishing up a biography of August Wilson and appears in the PBS documentary, and, and, and he also appears in the PBS documentary on August Wilson. Glasgow is also working on a biography of Kay Lee, Leroy Irvis, African-American speaker of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Glasgow's activities in Pittsburgh's African-American community go beyond teaching and research. For his community work, he received several awards in 2009, notably the Pittsburgh Courier's Men of Excellence Award and the YWCA's Racial Justice Award and Talk Magazine's Black History Merit Award. In 2010, he received the Chancellor's Distinguished Service Award. 
Glasgow also served on the advisory committee to restore the New Granada Theater in the Hill, delivered a lecture on the econ on, at the Economic Mini Summit on Black Empowerment, and spoke at the opening ceremonies of the K. Leroy Irvis Science Center at CCAC. In addition, he appeared on KQV Radio and WQED regarding the civil rights movement in Pittsburgh. He worked toward preservation of historic black sites in Pittsburgh as a member of the board of trustees of the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation and a member of Young Preservationist Association. Several round the world voyages with the Semester at Sea program and regular trips to Cuba have helped him place the history of black Pittsburgh in global perspective. Thank you so much, Dr. Glasgow, for being with us to share all of your experience and scholarship oh and work. It's exciting. Oh my, okay. Well, Thank you very much, Jessica. That was a really a very uh, full and uh, an appreciated introduction. Uh, it's been a real pleasure working on the history of Black Pittsburgh. I've been doing it for more than 10 years, it's probably more like 20, 25 years, in fact. Uh, and the more you get into it, the more fascinating material you find. It's really an extraordinarily rich and really inspiring um, history. Somebody like August Wilson, Pittsburgh born, grew up here. Um, and dedicated his place to the city is not, you know, he's not a, a lone flower blooming in a desert. There were other people who supported him, who were around him, who nurtured him, who he drew inspiration from, other poets and writers and artists. It was a very lively uh, community. Musicians, of course, without saying the jazz tradition here, all of that. So really, it's not that unexpected that, that Pittsburgh would produce someone like an August Wilson, that it was a, a city that had nurtured a lot of very talented um, individuals uh, from the black, uh, black community here. In particular, what I wanna talk about today was how August Wilson came to place so many of his plays, all but one of his major plays in Pittsburgh. Right. And it was a Black Bottom. It's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom that was placed in Chicago, the only play that wasn't in Pittsburgh. Exactly. That was the, his first his sort of breakthrough play. And they just filmed it and was just shown on Netflix. Probably people have seen, a lot of people have seen that play. That is set in Chicago. It was uh, uh, one of the theater critics here asked him why he said, you know, all, all but one of his plays in Pittsburgh, but his first play was in Chicago. And he said something very revealing. He said, well, I didn't think uh, I was just a beginning playwright. And I was worried that Pittsburgh wasn't an important enough place for me to write a play about and for it to get national recognition and acceptance. Right. He said later, of course, he changed his mind. And he said his plays in Pittsburgh. And that's what I want to talk about is what changed his mind? How did he go from his first play was set in, in Chicago, and all the rest were set uh, in Pittsburgh. And my argument is that it was really the influence, largely the influence of one individual, an artist, a famous black artist of the period that when August was, was working, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, named Rome, Romery Bearden. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people call him Romer, I always did because it's spelled R-O-M-A-R-E. Mm -hmm. So go figure, it looks like Romare. But uh, the family apparently, I asked the Bearden Foundation, the family pronounced it Romery. Doesn't matter, that wasn't what led August. What made August shift from say Chicago or he had done a play set in the far west, you know, things like that to Pittsburgh was uh, Bearden. One day in, uh, was in 1978, his, his good friend, Claude Purdy, himself a, a fine playwright, um, brought out a book of Bearden's paintings. Wilson had never seen these paintings, had never really seen paintings by Bearden at all. And immediately, he says, as soon as he saw it, he, he was captivated. It changed his mind. It changed his whole approach to writing, to, to the way he visualized the Black people. Mm -hmm. In particular, what he noticed was Bearden, this outstanding po um, uh, artist, focused on places and people he knew, not faraway places like Chicago or the West, but places that were outside, really outside his studio in Harlem. Mm -hmm. 
He'd look out his window and see people, see things. He'd write about ordinary people doing what look like ordinary things, but that they do it in a way that they become what he called rituals of daily life. That is, they gave meaning to their own, uh, their own experience. I wanted to just show one painting that uh, a lot of Beard and paintings influenced Wilson. Uh, people probably know some of them or most of them. But I want to show one painting that is not did not influence a specific play, but set the tone for influencing, I think, all of his plays. Okay. And that okay. is called The Street. It's a picture of a Harlem street. Now, if this works, I'm going to share my screen with people and show these uh, couple of images. Okay, so then I go share. My golly, it worked. Perfect. Okay, this is a, an image of Romary Bearden working in his studio in Harlem. Then uh, above his uh, studio workplace is a photograph of his um, um, grandfather and grandmother. There, he was from uh, Charlotte, uh, North Carolina uh, wound up. He spent some time in Pittsburgh, actually many years in the 1920s when he was a young boy. His family sent him here to uh, where he lived with a um, an aunt who had a rooming house down in the Strip District of Pittsburgh. Um, and so he got familiar with Pittsburgh, with the mills, with the people. And Pittsburgh was a part of, of Bearden's life. But in Pittsburgh, Bearden painted things he saw, people he saw. I want to show one picture of that that Bearden did. I don't know if this will go forward. Let's see. All right. Let me think. You may be able to go to your keyboard and press the um, cursor button that goes to the right, which advances forward. That's what I'm doing, but it's not. There. Okay. There it is. Nice. Um, I don't know what I did differently. <laughs> but there are a number of, of uh, Bearden paintings that influenced August. Um, uh, one, uh, I will, I'll go into them later if there are questions about them. But I wanted to show one that uh, he did not specific, August did not specifically talk about, but it has this sort of theme and feel of Wilson's plays. And I want to just take people, take a look at this, at this image. This is called The Street. It's in Harlem. You can see these are um, tenement buildings with the walk-ups on them. And the people in there, notice it's a crowded scene. People are standing um, in great diversity. Uh, and it's the sort of scene that one would commonly see at that time, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where Blacks would gather on streets uh, get out of their apartments and just gather, hang out, talk. Uh, it created a sort of a sort of community. And August had seen the same thing in Pittsburgh. He used to go out on Center Avenue, and he said you would see hundreds of people out in an afternoon. You don't see that today. You don't see that today. It's it's a different world. People don't gather in large large groupings like you would, like Bearden is is painting in this picture. But just look at some of these. Figures, I guess, I don't, okay. I can't get a, a pointer to, to show. Um, if you see in the center up toward the top, there's an old man on the stoop. He's uh, got his neatly trimmed beard, looking down in thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next to him is the face of a boy. Maybe his image, the thing he's thinking about, his younger persona. Uh, this boy, his eyes are wide open. It's like he's thinking about the future and what will become of him. Um, you see to the right of the boy, you see another young man. He's looking up and he's, um, he's looking out a window in the tenement. He's looking up at a large, large white bird. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, no telling what he's thinking, but he's sort of contemplating, contemplating that. If you look above that boy with the bright eyes, you see another boy at the very top of the picture. He's leaning on the windowsill, looking out. You can see his eyes. And it's like he wants to come out and join the, the scene down below in the street or something like that. Uh, you see 
down below on the sidewalk itself, you see two men. One is a worker, you can tell by his clothing and his cap he's got on. And next to him is a guy in a suit and a hat, okay? Diversity of economic status, and they're together. Um, beneath them are um, some men and they're talking and laughing, okay? Something that often went on on the streets of, of cities at that time. Um, then in front of those men, is a guitarist uh, standing there. You can see him with his with, holding a guitar. He's the fellow with his hat on. And next to him is a woman. She has his, her arm around him, kind of sad. Um, uh, and then um, to their right, or our right, you see a woman with African scarification on her face. See those lines going down her cheek? Down the front. Down the front, yeah. And then in front of that woman, somebody who's very close to the viewer, like right in the viewer's face, is a man in that lower right-hand corner. Uh, and all you see is his eye, his nose, and his forehead. And he's looking at you. It's kind of menacing uh, image. You don't know what he's thinking. Is he a threat, or is that just uh, your imagination? And finally, I'd like to point out there's a boy above this man um, who's sitting on some steps that lead up to the uh, highway there. Uh, maybe going uh, outside of Harlem, leading to his future, who knows? But the point is what Wilson observed in paintings like this, what Bearden did, was one, you notice these figures all face the viewer. They're facing the viewer. They're like figures on a, on a stage set. And that would have been very appealing to August. It's like a theater here. It's like a stage or, or an opera. It could be a theater or an opera. Um, second, the people are looking directly at the audience or the viewer and inviting the viewer almost to wonder, what are they thinking? What are they going to say? And a, a playwright like August then could put words in their mouth. There are lots of stories in these figures to be teased out. Uh, the other thing about the painting is this is not just a painting, it's also a collage. That is, it's, he takes bits and pieces of newspaper, of, of uh, objects, and embeds them in, the, um, in, his, uh, in his paintings. And August himself then came to work in what he called the collage uh, technique. He said he would take objects, um, um, a, a person with a scar on their face, a cat, um, I can't remember now, all these different objects. And he said he would just think about these objects and he say, I wanna put these in a play together and then make a story that revolves around all of them. Well, that's kind of what Bearden has done in this painting. He's got this collection of people all with an individual story to tell and a collective story to tell as well. And that's what August did with the rest of his paintings, you will see he doesn't stress the individual in his paintings, August paint, uh, in, his, um, in his plays. August plays are groups. And the important thing is the interaction. Like in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, for people who saw that, the main dynamics are not Ma Rainey, although the movie kind of made it more about Ma Rainey. But if you see the original play, the real action are the musicians, that group of musicians who are interacting with each other, okay? And you'll find that in all of Wilson's plays, it's really about the group. And that's what Bearden does in his, uh, in his paintings. And August said, I vowed from that point on, I would try to do plays that were the equivalent or the equal of Bearden's paintings. And I think that's the greatest tribute uh, uh, a playwright could make to another artist. And as a result of uh, the rest of his plays from then on were set in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh themes. And he said, I can portray the whole world just through the people of Pittsburgh. And that's, that's what he did just as Bearden did it with his paintings, August did it with his, with his plays. And it was a, a beautiful uh, combination. So I'll stop at that point if there are questions or comments, you know, we can go into those. Well, I will say that I think that that's the beauty of the sleight of hand for Bearden and, and Wilson, because it's through the relationships that Wilson is able to reveal the socioeconomic 
and the cultural circumstances in which his characters are living. And I think that involves a certain kind of, a certain kind of fanfare like coming and going. If we're talking about Ma Rainey's Black Bottom as our example in terms of playwriting, there's a lot of shifting in and out of the space there's a lot of shifting between the like studio where they're performing and back where they're rehearsing. And even here, the different shapes in the collage are showing a kind of movement, a kind of energy. It's a revelation of a certain kind of circumstance in which each of these individual figures come together to create one complete image. And even their relationship to one another creates a kind of perspective. Like the painting is called the street, but it's also the street view you feel like you're walking straight into it, like you're at eye level with everyone coming towards you. Yeah, as almost, almost as if you're in the flow. And whenever I've encountered Wilson plays being performed or the movie adaptations, I've always had that sense of having a close interior feeling of being within, as if I'm sitting on the steps or as if I'm looking out of my own window um, on certain settings. And so I think that even though, as you said before, they'd never met, that there's this, meeting of the minds in terms of how important it is to tell a story of a community through revealing relationships and intimacies. Um, but if you want to stop sharing so that way people can see more of us, that would be nice too. Okay, yep, I can do that. Let's see. Uh, where's my... I think if you hover at the oh, top... Oh, there, 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 there it is. It. Wait, I, okay. Stop share. There, okay. So I Thank wanted to you. ask about that, the transition from August writing about places outside of Pittsburgh back to Pittsburgh in, in this book that we're talking about, okay. it really, really outlines Wilson's complicated relationship with the Hill District as a result of the sociocultural, socioeconomic pressures on the Hill while he was growing up there and being educated in Pittsburgh. Can you speak a little bit more to the times that August Wilson was turning into August Wilson from uh, Freddie Kettle to August Wilson um, and how that affected him to want to go away, but also to come back. Like what made that relationship so complicated? Yeah, it was a complicated relationship and Wilson had a complicated uh, childhood. Uh, one, he was the interracial child of a, uh, a German immigrant father and an African-American mother. So uh, he never was, uh, people never harassed him for being interracial, but he was harassed for being light-skinned. Uh, the kids used to chase him home after school, him and his sisters. Uh, the darker kids would chase uh, August and his two sisters home from school, and they'd go running up the street um, every day. So that had an impact um, on him, on, on his sense of identity. Second, uh, the Wilson family was very poor. His father had a had a wife on the south side of Pittsburgh, mm. down um, uh, off Route 51, Sawmill Run Boulevard. I can't think of the neighborhood. Ah, oh, geez. Anyway, he so he had a, a wife on one side of town and August's mother as his uh, long-term relationship, but they weren't married. So this was this was a problem. But the greater problem was. He, he did not contribute financially much to the family. And so the family lived in great poverty. They didn't have running water. They didn't have an indoor toilet. The uh, living conditions there where they were, there, it was the poorest house in the, in the neighborhood in terms of physical uh, conditions. So August felt the sting of this. I know when he went to elementary school, uh, there were kids from what was called Sugar Top that is the upper hill there, who that was where the black middle class and elite families used to live. Uh, uh, the part of the hill that goes way up toward Oakland. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the few friends August had in school uh, said, you know, his parents had told him never go down to Wilson's neighborhood or his house, you know, a bad area. But he said, one day I decided I was gonna do that. So he walked down to August's place and he said, I got to the house and it looked so bad. I was scared and I said, oh, hell no, I'm not going in there. And I left. Well, that was a sort of uh, economic differential that Wilson felt. You know, he was very, grew up poor. And so he never was comfortable around the black middle class. 
You notice he only did one play. That was his very last play, Radio Golf, that involves the middle class. And he never was comfortable or friendly toward the middle class, uh, the black middle class. He didn't really, uh, didn't really care for it. So I think those were some of the things that made his life uh, difficult, his childhood difficult. On the other hand, where he did find his, his release was through his poetry. He was a poet and the Hill District had a lot of guys who were writing poetry at the time. Uh, Rob Penny uh, was, was one of them. Uh, Nick Flournoy was another. Charlie Williams was a third. And they were writing poetry that, and they accepted August. He became one of the gang and they traded poems and critiqued each other and went out for drinks and did all sorts of things uh, together. And it was through them, especially through Rob Penny, the poet, that August got introduced to uh, black nationalism and uh, Mary Baraka, Malcolm X and all that. And he was accepted by, by that group. He didn't have a, a problem, you know, even with his, his light skin, which was a problem in some places, it was not a problem with him because he had the right political orientation, let's say, of he was very much uh, engaged in, in black nationalism, Malcolm X and that. And so that was like his big uh, saving grace that he, he found these guys or they found him or they found each other, I guess we'd say. Um, and they stimulated each other. They read each other's poems and critiqued it. He worked out of a gallery that I talk about in that book called the Halfway Art Gallery, mm -hmm. right on Center Avenue near the, uh, not far from the New Granada Theater. And they'd have poetry readings on Sunday. They'd have art shows. They'd have jazz performances, all sorts of things that brought people together uh, for cultural evenings uh, that were very exciting and that made August really love the city and made it a, a, the sort of place he wanted to explore. Uh, Center Avenue, and he spent lots and lots of time exploring, uh, exploring the avenue, just walking up and down, observing people. Um, and the thing about August also, he had a photographic memory. Mm. And so he would spend a lot of time listening to conversations. I had one of his girlfriend tell him, tell me that um, they would, uh, they would spend time in Eddie's restaurant, uh, on a date, just listening in on other people's conversations. And that's where he got the knowledge of how people talk. Um, but he also had a photographic memory so he could remember everything he heard people say exactly as they said it with the accent, the hand gestures and all of that. And she said once, you know the play uh, Fences where the father and the son, they get in that big argument and the boy says, how come you don't like me? Mm -hmm. And the father says, oh, get out of my face. Uh, in effect, uh, I put shoes on your feet and clothes on your back and food on your table. Don't give me that baloney. She said they actually heard that walking up Center Avenue, coming out of an apartment window, that actual conversation. And August, you know, put it in his, put it in his play. So speaking so, of his photographic memory, Sandra Shannon has a question. She says, yeah, hello, sure. Professor Glasgow. Was August influenced by the very nature of the collage as an art form? How did the collage speak to his commentary on Black culture? And thinking of the photographic memory, it seems to me that if he could, act, if he could almost exactly remember spaces, places, and events, that the collage as an imagery that he saw in Romer Bearden's work, Romery Bearden's work, that would overlap and be an influence. Yes, yes, very much. Um... He was, he said that he worked in a collage. I think I mentioned this at the beginning. I'm trying to find, I've written it down. But he said he would start out with objects himself and place them in his mind of individual people and things and sites and animals and the pizza or whatever, and then write a story that connected them. So he saw his own plays as collages. And you'll notice his plays are not strong on the, uh, on the plot. The plot is not important in an August Wilson play. It's a lot of individual scenes and monologues or dialogues and things people say and interactions, but they don't really, it doesn't really hinge on 
uh, in most cases, how the plot works out is these uh, interactions that are taking place. And that's sort of like the collage as well. It's collections of, of individual groupings and how they how they interact with one another and what they what they have to say. The development of the Hill as a community over time has a lot of uniqueness about it. In the book, there's this mention that schools in the Hill were desegregated in 1880. Exactly. And then we also know, we know that, you know, like uh, Brown versus Bo Board of Education was in 1956, so 19, between 1954 and 1956. 54. Mm -hmm. 54. 54. And so how did the Hill come to have desegregated schools in 1880? And how did that change the Hill district that August Wilson may have been educated in? Because there's also a, there's also an anecdote in the book about August Wilson dropping out of school as soon as he was 16 years old, because he had uh, such yeah. a contentious relationship as an African American man with white educators. Right, right. Well, actually, the Hill that he grew up in at the time he grew up, still had a very large uh, or had a moderately large white population. His street, the neighborhood where he grew, say the three, four, five blocks around him was about half black, half white. The whites there were Italian, Jewish, and Syrian. Um, his neighbor in front of him, where of his house was uh, the Sigers, Bella Siger, who figures in some of his plays. She had a market, she was Jewish. Mm -hmm. The family next door to them were the Buteras, Johnny Butera, they ran a, he was a, um, a watch repairman and his brother was a shoe repairman. Uh, across the street was the Goldblums, uh, a Jewish uh, uh, physicians, um, as well as the, uh, his, his best friend, uh, Aunt, um, Oh, gee, his mother's best friend, aunt. Okay, just can't think of her name. Um, so there was, it was a very interracial neighborhood that he grew up in. The elementary school where he attended was, uh, was interracial, black and white. Uh, so he was, he was used to being around whites as well as blacks. Um, the thing when he left school, that teacher was black. He does not, sometimes, um, there are a couple of occasions when he says that. Uh, and that experience where the teacher accused him of plagiarizing, um, and August gives the impression that, well, as a white teacher, he'd assume that I, that a black student couldn't write a really good paper. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the man, I, I know his wife, um, and he was a very distinguished, very committed uh, black, uh, black educator. And he had been worried about August because August had not been doing well in school, had not been doing his work. And then apparently August all of a sudden decided, oh man, I wanna to go to college, I better pick it up. And so he decided to get serious. And he just went off and wrote this brilliant paper. So this, his teacher, Mr. Biggs, was astounded at it and demanded he show that he had really produced it. Um, and August had an attitude of nobody's telling me, I don't have to prove anything. If I say I wrote it, you just believe I wrote it and I, I have proven nothing to you. And so uh, that's when he walked out of school because Biggs gave him an F on the paper because he, he, August wouldn't confirm or demonstrate that he had in fact written the paper and he walked out. But I think August was going through some real serious personal struggles at that time. He, he dropped out of three schools in succession. He went to Central Catholic School in, in the city. Now, there he did encounter racial uh, harassment mm -hmm. from the white students. It was a Catholic, predominantly white school, uh, and he did get, get harassed. But then he went down to Connolly Trade School there in the hill, which is right overlooking uh, what became the civic arena. It's now the, they use it as uh, to teach people how to do environmental engineering type things. It's still in use that it's a big building right at the um, right there. I can't think of a street. Um, and he lasted there just a few months. He, he slugged the teacher. <laughs> I mean, he was in a bad mood. I'm not sure totally what was going on. So he left there and he went to school in Hazelwood 
And that's where he then walked out. So he was, you know, teenagers. It's a time of angst and struggle and stress. And uh, the full story is still not complete, not clear, but it's a complicated story. And um, it, uh, but he enjoyed it. He was a person who wanted to learn on his own. He didn't want anybody telling him anything. His nickname, he loved, his hero was Napoleon. And that's what he wrote the paper on that was so good that his teacher didn't think he wrote it. Right. But he'd always played the role of Napoleon as a boy. And so much so that his nickname among his, his pals there in the, in the uh, lower hill near his home when he was a little kid, they called him Napoleon because he always wanted to take, well, he liked somebody with authority, with power, assertion, independence. And so he was his own little Napoleon, you know, I do my own thing. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And he was very independent, very independent thinker. And it showed up, I think that was part of this rebellion. He was, he was asserting his own independence as much as anything. One of the most impactful images from the book, and I'm going to try to show it because um, of just how much it affected me, is this map of the new street grid that, supposed, that was supposed to accompany the building of the Civic Arena back in um, 1961. And so this was in 1956. So you can literally see the pale streets and the circle where the Civic Arena was gonna be over the neighborhood of the Lower Hill. In yes. the book, it mentions that there were a lot of mixed feelings about the that revitalization project via the Civic Arena in the Lower Hill. Some people felt like, the neighborhood there had to go because of, you know, like improper waste, improper sewage, um, the houses not being in working condition. And then there were others that felt like it should not have happened. And I feel like even during my time, the Hill has always been in the middle of this conversation of being redeveloped or as some people would say, gentrified. And so I was wondering if you could speak to this constant attempt to redevelop the Hill, especially now we have the University of Pittsburgh that is having the community engagement centers open up in the Hill District. And there's a lot of talk about new development happening. And so what does this, what does this constant force of redevelopment from the city do for, the, for or to the black community positively or negatively. And since so much of this redevelopment was happening when August was younger, I imagine it, contribute, it contributed to the social pressures he must have been feeling. I mean, a lot of his characters talk about gentrification and redevelopment as well in his plays. Oh, absolutely. And um, that's why that's the, the central theme of his play Radio Golf is about urban renewal of the Hill District, you know, new plans to redevelop it in the and the hill is in danger of losing its historical character and its, its uh, values and its history and everything that makes it special. And uh, so you see this conflict going on. And he, he had seen this himself growing up. Um, his family, the redevelopment of the hill where they tore it down, the, much of the lower hill, was, began in around 1956 and it lasted close to around 1960 before it was finished. Uh, and his family moved in 1958 to Hazelwood, okay? So they were, their area was not torn down. Their housing was not torn down, but there was a general outmoving of many people from the Hill District and people thought it was, it was time to, it was time to move, time to leave. And so it did personally affect him. Uh, when he came back as a young man, as the age of 20, when he declared himself a, a, a a playwright formally, he got an apartment that directly overlooked the Civic Arena. Mm -hmm. So he saw that huge destroyed area every day right from where he was living and was keenly aware of that and the loss and what it meant. So he was one of those who really uh, regretted what the Hill had lost. Some people in the Hill originally had been in favor of urban redevelopment, Blacks. In fact, they had looked downtown and seen where they redeveloped the downtown area. They redeveloped some areas on the south side uh, for new, new housing. And in fact, they had said to the city, hey, what about us? Don't we ever get a shot at, at new housing and better things? And so they were promised new housing uh, in exchange for tearing down, down the hill. And they were promised jobs in, in tearing down the hill but they never got either one. 
They never got the unions wouldn't let black workers be part of the uh, tearing down of the place and the rebuilding of it. And then there was no place in the hill. The hill at that time was very, very densely populated. There was no place for a huge new uh, population to move to. They'd have to move to some other neighborhood. Well, that would be a white neighborhood. The other white neighborhoods did not want people from the hill. So they fought it and the thing never got done and people had to move because they were, they were losing their homes and they went out to other neighborhoods like the Wilsons went to Hazelwood, others went to Homewood uh, and other, other places. So it was a, a traumatic uh, experience for the, for the community um, and it was something that, that Wilson felt strongly about. On the other hand, a lot of the dynamism of the Hill District remained. People think, well, that was the end of the Hill. Nothing happened, you know, was going on. But in fact, I've talked to guys who were there, August Wilson's buddies at the time in the 60s. And they said Center Avenue was jumping because a lot of those businesses that were torn down on Lower Wiley mm -hmm. moved to Center Avenue. So Center Avenue then became the main uh, jumping, jumping place in, in the Hill. And that's where August and Salah Udin and Rob Penny and Nick Flournoy and all of these black artists and writers, musicians, there were all sorts of nightclubs. It was Center Avenue was still a big bustling area. There was a lot going on. And August himself talks about there were times he couldn't go to bed for three days because he afraid he'd miss something. There was so much going on that he didn't sleep. And I've talked to other guys who say, oh yeah, it was just like nonstop things to do. But that changed again in 1968 with the death of Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King. That's right, with the death of Martin Luther King and the riots uh, that burned down the uh, many of the retail establishments in the Hill, then it didn't recover. Then they, they did not return. Uh, so now it's been a long, slow, gradual climb back with uh, Crawford Roberts uh, housing and uh, things like that but it's never revitalized as a retail district. There were lots of stores. There were in, in the 10 or so blocks that Wilson used to frequent, gee, I forget the exact numbers. It was like 150 retail establishments. There were restaurants, there were nightclubs, there were funeral parlors, there were gas stations, there were uh, clothing stores, shoe stores, barber shops on and on and on. There were many, many flower shops, many, many businesses operated there, some by whites, some by blacks. Um, and it was, uh, it, re it remained a lively area. But once the riots hit, it didn't revive uh, because one reason was insurance companies wouldn't insure anybody then. Mm -hmm. And businessmen can't really, you got all your stock, well, you got to have insurance. So if you can't get insurance, you're really not going to take a place. So it sort of got sort of redlined by the uh, uh, in, in that in that regard, uh, insurance companies. So how uh, does the new talk of urban renewal or redevelopment today around the hill, especially related to University of Pittsburgh, differ than previous conversations? Is it different at all? And can the black community there trust this urban renewal talk more than they did before? Oh, it's, it's very different. It's very different. And I think there's a lot more trust. One thing the city learned was the old urban renewal was top down. The powers that be at the top, the millionaires, the big corporations and the like, they decided what area they wanted. And they used eminent, what's called eminent domain, the power mm -hmm. of eminent domain where the city can go in, say, we want your property. We will have it assessed and we will pay you what the assessor says they think it's worth. And that's it. End of story. You're out. Well, they've learned that not to do that again, because that created so much ill will. So now you'll notice in the redevelopment in the Hill, you will find new places, but interspersed with them are some old places. Right? Have you noticed those? I've you'll noticed find old houses. Mm -hmm kind of interspersed among the new places. Right. Well, those old houses are, are people who did not want to sell and did not have to sell. So now they don't have to sell. 
Nobody will take somebody's property. So that is one huge difference that has calmed nerves, uh, not 100%. People are still suspicious. Rightfully but, so. The history of redevelopment so. in Black neighborhoods hasn't been great nationally. No, no, has not. But the city is not going to do, again, that top-down eminent domain, we'll take your property whether you like it or not. And the problem with taking the property, you see, the city paid actually a fair price for the property. But the price went to the landlords because mm. they were the owners. Blacks were renters, so Blacks didn't get anything. All the money went to the landlords and the owners who could take the money, start a business someplace else, build a new house someplace else. But the people the, uh, with less income who were renting from them, they didn't get anything because they compensated the owners. Right. You see. So that's where it was so... Um, so destructive and so uh, uh, frustrating for many, for the residents, black residents. We have a question from a Filomeno Didiano and Filomena asks, did, it's an August Wilson question. Did August Wilson have any religious background? Did he attend any Catholic, ele Catholic elementary school or just Pittsburgh Catholic? Oh, he, he was very Catholic, he and his sisters. Um, August was, uh, he went to, at first he went to Lecce School, which is a public school there on Bedford Avenue. Mm -hmm. It still stands, the building, down toward what had been the um, uh, Connolly Trade School. Uh, that was the public school. That's the one where he got chased home all the time, down the street. After that, then he, um, he was uh, struck by a, an, a, a black woman, Miss Sarah, whom he talks about in some of his plays, uh, Sarah Degree, if you yes. read his, okay, there was a woman uh, who was a model for this Sarah Degree, who was herself Catholic and had it as her project to recruit as many black kids in the Hill District to the Catholic Church as possible. And she came by and she recruited August and his two sisters to uh, go to uh, St. Richard's School. And so that's where he had, he attended school, elementary school. He and his, his sisters wanted to become nuns and actually studied to become nuns. They never did. They didn't complete the, the training. And he originally was going to become a priest. So that's how there, there are a lot of religious references in August plays because he did know the Bible. <laughs> he was serious early on reading the Bible uh, very carefully. And... Um, was was very much taken by by Miss Sarah. She was the woman he most uh, most admired, probably of all. And she's referred to in the play. Uh, what's the play? Where, uh, geez, but I can't think of it. <laughs> Do you remember offhand maybe any references that he may have made to Catholicism in his plays? No, not to Catholicism. I mean, well, I know just like in Fences, referencing the angel Gabriel blowing his horn in terms of the character Gabriel that he himself said that Gabriel represented him. Yeah, right. So he has many religious, right. He has many biblical allusions, but I don't recall anything specifically to Catholicism. Um, but um, he, he was, he was not a church going religious person, but inside he was personally moved by religious uh, ethics and morals and things like that. So he was a very ethical, moral, religious person, just not a formal um, churchgoer. So I wanted to shift a little bit to talk a little bit more about your work. because I oh, read his, mother, his mother became a devout Catholic too. She joined the Catholic Church and belonged to St. Uh, Benedict the Moor. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. I wanted to ask about the research you were or did do with um, dollar savings and loans. I read in an article that you had noticed that there had been a lot of black investment from black business people, professionals and educators in building the Hill District. And you also in your work like to focus on, I think um, 
those narratives about the Hill District as a Black community that don't so much paint a total picture of necessarily like hardship and struggle. And so you're finding these narratives that give a more dynamic image of the Hill District. Could you talk a little bit about that research and what you found? Oh, exactly. Yes, that's um, the Hill District was one of great diversity, economic as well as racial. Uh, the black middle class lived in the Hill, the black working class lived in the Hill. You had white middle class, uh, immigrant, uh, ethnic uh, Jews and it Italians and Syrians and working class. So it was a very diverse area economically and racially and ethnically. So that gave it a different uh, texture from what we see now. Now we seem that we have more areas that do not have the diversity of, uh, you know, neighborhoods that are, that are just poor and other neighborhoods that are middle class and others that are, let's say, upper class. Uh, so it was a, an area that um, uh, where he lived, for example, where he grew up as a boy, people didn't lock their doors. There was no, uh, there was no crime. There was no, there were no thefts, nothing, no noise. The police hardly ever came. I, I can't say there was never any, but by and large, it was a very quiet, safe, neighborhood and it was not a particular it was not a wealthy neighborhood at all it was uh you know blue collar uh and the likes and so blacks and whites so he grew up and i think that's one reason the communities he portrays in his plays are very positive communities i mean these are poor people some bad things do happen but the people and the community itself is not a devastated, uh, down and out, uh, hopelessly impoverished and depressed area at all. They're struggling, they're arguing, they're talking, they're philosophizing. <laughs> um, and all, all of this, they're very active. And that was the sort of neighborhood that that's what it was like, more like when he was when he was growing up, there was still a lot of diversity, uh, a lot more than what one sees today. Okay. Now they're trying in the new housing to maintain a little more diversity where like in the Crawford Roberts, you have some people who rent at what they call market rate, others who rent at a subsidized rate as a way of increasing the economic uh, diversity there. And so there are, there are efforts uh, to do that, but it's not nearly to the extent that it would have been back when August was was very young. I noticed that during my time even living in the Hill, like as a student who, you know, of course, most of my program companions lived in Friendship or they lived in Highland Park or they lived off and I lived in the Hill and I noticed like if I called Vaselli's, they wouldn't deliver or Ubers and, and Lyfts. People who were not living there had this perception that because it was a black neighborhood that for some reason it wasn't safe. And I've never, I'd never been unsafe living in the Hill, but I noticed that people's perceptions of the Hill were largely based on racial tropes and racism that didn't adequately reflect the neighborhood. And it's, it's interesting to me that that perspective that you just mentioned has kind of continued, like the one dimensional note about the Hill District because it is a black neighborhood um, has kind of overtaken this dynamic and diverse history Exactly. Yes, and that's that's so true. People tend to, of places that they don't know personally, they form generalizations based on things they've heard. And so usually the things that get talked about is when something bad happens, something goes wrong. That's what gets in the paper. Or that's the thing that everybody's talking about. Day-to-day -day life, well, you know, nobody stresses that because that's just everyday, everyday life. And I know with my, I teach a class every year on the history of Black Pittsburgh, and we always do a walking tour of the Hill. I've had, on almost every time when I announce it in class, Black students from Pittsburgh will say, we're going, where? The Hill? Are you sure? Like, is that a good idea? Because they're from Homewood, you see, or they're from the North side. They don't really know the Hill. So they have these stereotypes of people in the Hill. I've talked to people from the Hill, if they talk about Homewood, it's like, oh no, I don't go to Homewood. Oh no, oh, that's, uh, you know, uh, that I could be trouble. 
because they don't know Homewood. So a lot of this is people just don't know, they don't experience. And that's what this, my little walking tours really changed the students' minds. They're, they're so surprised we meet people. Uh, people come up and talk to us just at random. It's not people I've set up, you know, to come out and talk, but just walking around. It's, and we like to do it in the spring or early in the fall when people are out. And you just get a chance to walk and talk. And people are curious because they say, what's this, you know, mob of 30, 30 people walking, <laughs> walking down Center Avenue or Bedford or something. And uh, they're interested in talking and find out what's, what's up, who are you? And we have nice conversations and it just changes the perception. When people come back to class, they have a very different impression, feeling. So we have a question from the wonderful Nancy Washington. Hello, Miss Washington. Um, she asked, she says and asks, Wilson has said that along with Bearden and Blues, Jorge Luis Borges was a big influence on his writing. Where can we see this in his plays from Nancy Washington? Oh, that's a very good. I think, in my impression, now Chris Ra Chris Rawson thinks there's a big influence. I don't see it. I do see it in the play uh, Seven Guitars, because the play begins at the ending. You mm. know, uh, the hero is already dead, and then it's well, how did he get to this point? Why did he die so young? So the play is like a flashback. And this was one of the marks of Borges. He, he, his usual, one of his trademarks was starting the, the story at the end. So you knew how it was going to come out. And the drama and the tension was, well, how did this, how did this happen? You know, so that was one thing. That's the, that's the one example that I can uh, come up with. I don't find too much um, out, of, out of Borges other than, other than that. Um, so thank you, Nancy. That's a good, that's a good question. It is. It's a wonderful question. And so my next question is how, when and how did Wilson change his mind? In the book, August Wilson, you know, uh, Pittsburgh Places and His Life and Plays, it says that being in cities like St. Paul and in the Northwest gave him distance and allowed him to see Pittsburgh differently. And then there was another quote where he goes, he says, sometimes I want to come home so bad and I'm home, then I want to get the first train out. And what made him change his mind into dedicating his life to there? Was there a seminal moment? Was, and aside from Bearden's construction of the neighborhood, what was it that made Wilson all of a sudden decide that his rejection of the space was something he wanted to mitigate artistically? Yeah, hmm, good, good question. I don't think he ever rejected the space. He loved, he loved walking the street. I call him a flaneur, which is a terrible word. If you can think of a better word the, for the, the French word for people, artists who would walk around the working class areas of Paris in the 19th century and then go back and paint uh, about what they had seen, uh, cafe scenes or working scenes. Or they would, would we write call some that a griot? Poem. What's that? Would we call him a kind of griot then? Oh, absolutely a griot, yes. Yes. Oh, maybe I'll do that. Yeah, call him a griot instead of a flaneur. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll give you credit for that, yes. Um, so he had always been one. He loved to walk. He did not have a car. He never had a car. I don't even think he has ever had a car. At least he, not much of a car. He didn't drive. And he walked or took a bus, but usually he walked. He used to live in, uh, in uh, East Liberty and he would walk to Pitt to participate in the uh, Black Studies Department programs here. And that's a long, that's a long walk from East Liberty to the University of Pittsburgh. Yes. Uh, he would walk downtown. Uh, I talked to uh, a girl he dated who worked at the Arby's store. It's still there down, downtown on, What's that, Penn Avenue or whatever that avenue? Um, and he would walk there, which is a long, you know, it's a long hike downtown. So he liked to walk. Well, when you walk, it gives you, it puts you closer to people. Uh, you, you, you can feel uh, the atmosphere. You hear people talking, you interact with people more. And he just always loved 
uh, loved doing that. And so he, he never got away from that. Uh, and it really sank in. When he left, it gave him a chance to, well, he said he got homesick. And he'd think back on Pittsburgh and the people he had heard talk, the people he had seen, the people he had known, and they became the basis then for what he was what he was writing. Uh, he used them, and he would he would come back pretty regularly to the city. Partly, he had his mother was here, his uh, uh, nieces and nephews were here, his old buddies were here, guys he had talked to in the in the uh, bars and in uh, some of the some of the shops and restaurants were still here, and he liked meeting them. Uh, so he would come back and kind of renew his his energy, uh, and uh, Pittsburgh just remained part of him in that uh, in that regard. But more as as memories than uh, after he left, he never never came back to live, but he did come back regularly several times a year to to visit. Uh, and our last question is the biography. You're working on it. I'm still working on it. It's How long have you been working on it? I've been working on Oh, I don't want to tell you. No. Uh, <laughs> probably longer than you are old. No, about, let's see, 10 over 10 years, I'd say. 10 years or so. A little more, maybe. Uh, there's so much there. It's so rich. I've talked to so many, so many people, gotten so many great stories. I got to get it out because uh, there's just a lot of great stories. And unfortunately, some of the people I talk to you know, they've already passed. Mm -hmm. You know, people I really love to have them read the book, see their name and and comment on it and stuff like that. And I, um, Aunt Julie, Julia, Julia, uh, she's the wife of the boxer. Burley, Burley, Tom Burley, the, the prize fighter. His wife, Julia Burley, was the Wilson family's uh, best friend and he called her Aunt Julie. Well, she gave me so much rich, rich information about the Wilsons. Ah, the woman, she died about five years ago, you know. So I feel so bad that she doesn't get to read it. So, and there are other people like that, that I want to be able to read it because I owe it to them that they contributed so much and are so much a part of keeping that memory uh, alive that I really want them to have a chance to read, um, to read the book. Well, so, Dr. Glasgow, we have to immensely thank you for your work and your life's dedication to African-American history and to the Hill District in Pittsburgh and as well as August Wilson's life and legacy. I wanna thank everybody who's joined us this evening for this conversation. Um, please have a great weekend. Please take care of yourselves, stay safe, stay healthy and wear your masks. Have a good night. Thank you, bye bye.